Adam, uh, could you just say a few words about Nasheed and what oh, yeah. the lecture is about? So then let's pick up this Yeah, I already did, but I, I can do it again. Um, so Nasheed Nabian is a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. She teaches a class called Real Time Cities. And the lecture is going to be on real-time cities and urban cybernetics. So using data, real-time data, sim similar to what we do at Sensible City Lab, using real-time data um, on a city to, to create projects and um, do urban interventions with um, data collection. And um, so I think we can, uh, you know, this is the kind of last presentation, and recently we do need Missing mode probably too much. Then we have um, a kind of uh, session where actually it's you who's going to do some work, and you know so we can actually all stand up and uh, do some exercise, and then uh, and then look at the at the man with the movie camera just to finish. But uh, Adam, why don't you go ahead and finish it? And we might also because we're a little bit late, we might look at the beginning. And then we'll skip some of the examples, but uh, yeah. but let's start. Okay. And if there's a part that gets really boring, just tell me to skip that part. And... <laughs> yeah, I'll, it, it's I'll, an thing to I'll say. put this on the wiki site for you to download so you can finish the boring parts later. Yeah, so everybody can then watch it over and over again every night. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm Nashita. I teach classes in urban development. I'm going to talk about the project. So, I'm also first up to a fellow at MIT Sensible City Lab. Unfortunately, I don't think you can join me in person for this call. So we decided to have a pre-recorded session. And what we are doing by the journey with professional and answer section, which follows. First and foremost, I would like to welcome all of you to this introductory lecture on urban informatics as it relates to the idea of real time cities. Real time cities deploy novel technologies to merge urbanity with digital information so that the built environment is dynamically sensed and synchronously actuated to perform more efficiently, intelligently, and sustainably. Contemporary digital culture has influenced our spatial thinking to the point where the digital is not a substitution for the physical but augments and enhances it to create realities consisting of layers of physical and digital reality, cross-reference with the aid of technology that is the subject of my investigation for today's talk. This type of research is significant because a lot is changing in how we produce and consume our spaces of habitation. This is well manifested in new tech terminologies that have been constantly surfacing our urban related discourse, ranging from conceptual frameworks such as variable computing, augmented realities, smart materials, or tangible interfaces, to well branded technologies that we deploy on a day to day basis, such as virtual platforms like Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, or actual technologies like broadband internet, Wi-Fi wireless connections, and GPS location link. This technocultural paradigmatic shift allows for architectural and urban solutions that are aware of their context. As a result, they are capable of renegotiating their goals based on emergent conditions. They are able to solicit their inhabitants' dynamic needs and desires, as well as to transform into mediating fields of urban interaction. A digitally augmented space, be it a standalone architecture or an urban setting, is a temporalized space. I also would like to claim that such a space is a subjective and subjective space. It is a technologically enhanced space, and it is a heavily networked space. What do I mean when I claim that such spaces are temporalized? Throughout the history, architecture has primarily been about erecting durable structures that resist the degenerative impact of time. In digital augmentation scenarios, however, time is generative and pregnant with perpetual eventfulness. 
Therefore, the designer designs for ephemeral spatial relations that unfold through time as opposed to substantial spatial compositions that resist time. The physical space is augmented with a layer of digital information that is temporal by nature because it is a pattern of zeros and bonds creating a rhythm of absence and presence. In this case, the focus of design is partially shifted from the spatial allocation of substance or materials to the temporal allocation of non-substance or basically information, where the space is enveloped in different temporalities. Absolute time, relative time, root time, when processes are programmed to be repeated at certain intervals, recursive time, when each iteration of the repeating loop is a slightly different from the previous iteration as a response to a change in some contextual information, real time, when multiple processes are programmed with some level of synchronicity, and reversible time, when we get access to the recorded log of some past processes at present. Such architectures and urban settings are sentient machines for habitation, registering emerging conditions and synthesizing the response accordingly. Once spaces become context of where decision-making entities, the subject is incorporated as an entity with transient needs and preferences as a hyper-individualized user instead of a predefined generic inhabitant. This user is hyper-connected through telecommunication technologies, ultra-mobile by aid of transportation boosts, extensively subjective because of the information revolution's democratization of knowledge, hyper-individual as a result of her desires, being constantly solicited by new technologies, and digitally extended to an unprecedented extent. Ideally, our digitally augmented architectures and urban settings, these sentient machines for habitation are networked. The extreme vision is a Pandoran world of hyperconnections where all entities are connected through space and time either by hierarchical infrastructures or by peer-to-peer -peer ad hoc networks. And they possess the complete digitized memory of the past that is enhanced with pattern recognition algorithms that allow for anticipating the future as well. The technologies that facilitate digital augmentation are technologies that acquire or deliver information back to it, technologies that reach spatial distance or connectivity technologies, technologies that reach temporal distance or memory storage and management technologies, and technologies of geolocalization that allow layers of delivered information to be situated within the physical landscape that they augment. They transform the augmented space to a real-time locality or a geotagable geocacheable space where the physical and digital terrain are connected by information placeholders with known geographical locations. In what I define as real-time localities, the virtual representation of the space is the interface through which information is acquired and delivered. Like a dynamic interactive Google map, that is populated with placeholders of various real-time information accessed by a sedentary user behind the computer screen. In what we identify as geotagable, geocacheable spaces, the physical space itself becomes the interface for acquisition and delivery of digital content. Agents geotag and geocache information dynamically based on their real-time locations this is the case for almost all location-based services that users get access to via their smartphones while on their own and navigating the city. Technologically enhanced possibilities of consumption and production of space 
generate certain tension in contemporary architectural and urban related discourse. Given the emergent, technologically driven, paradigmatic shift in how we design, build, and inhabit the space, the question is what is the role of us as architects, urban designers, landscape designers, and basically as individuals involved in the spatial practices? Citing Rudolf L. Curry, as social professor of architecture at the University of Toronto, I would like to point out that these two projects, the monolith by Jean Nouvel and the floor building by Wiener Scopidio, both showcased in the very same event, which is the sixth Swiss National Exposition in 2002, illustrate this dialectic. One refers the object of architecture by retreating into a fundamental, platonic, recognizable form. The other is a boundless, open-ended, focused field with no clear extremities and diffuse boundaries. One exemplifies the autonomy of architectural object. The other is a network system of a very sophisticated, intelligent chain of computers that are regulating all the critical moments in the construction of a very strange atmospheric event. One is very much about the hardware, the other is driven by software. One is clearly a moon. Lexity. Lines of light arranged in the dark space of the night, clusters and constellations of that, like city lights, we see. This, is, this was a quote from the uh, 60, page 69. Uh, but my, my suggestion is for you. In the answer, the airman answer, efficient as No, I think it is. Uh, I think we can jump in. Maybe I would go there still because he, he, she explains the, the framework is uh, in the course she's teaching at Harvard. So maybe we can still see a few minutes from where we were um, in about uh, the dinner and the de Jean Nouvel, and then we can skip the second part. Of it. But I think the, the theoretical framework, I think, is still worth listening to, and then we can jump. Yeah, yeah. jump to the example. One exemplifies the autonomy of architectural object, the other is a network system of a very sophisticated, intelligent chain of computers that are regulating all the critical moments in the construction of a very strange atmospheric event. One is very much about hardware, the other is driven by software. One is clearly a moon, the other is about atmospheres. One is creating a space for an event, the other is preoccupied with the temporal deployment of that event. The tensions in this dialectic are latent in any contemporary work combining the two. A good example is John Nouvel's blue cube wrapped in translucent wires that transform its exterior surface to a big computer screen. It tends to dematerialize and act as an interface communicating information. At the same time, it establishes its condition as an architectural object. We can say that it is an architectural interface, a hybrid spatial construct born out of the combining the virtual and the physical. I think I will stop here and move to the next section of my presentation for today which is focused on the theoretical agenda of what I define as real-time savings. In a 2000... Do you want to hear that? I, I think we should hear that. Just yeah. Yeah. Then uh, jump to skip the example. Okay. Well, you, you, you really want to temper. I'll temper it. It is not the that will define the world as the transformation of everything. It will be a big hit on YouTube. This interpretation of the digital realm corresponds to the 90s epidemic of faith in the possibility of replacing the actual with the virtual. This vision even encompasses the practices about uploading human consciousness to the realm of cyberspace, as manifested in cyberpunk and the sci fi literature genre, where the space of the future has no physicality but consists of digital encoded transactions. For example, a 1984 novel by William Gibson, Normanser, is a standard work in the cyberpunk genre. 
attached to power monster, the term cyberspace gained recognition to become the de facto term for the World Wide Web during the 90s. The portion of the novel usually cited in this respect is cyberspace, a conceptual hallucination experienced daily by millions of legitimate operators in every nation. A graphic representation of that time abstracted from banks of every computer in the human system. Unthinkable complexity. Lines of light range in the night space of the mind. Clusters and constellations of that, like CD lights, we see. This, is, this was a quote from the uh, 60, page 69 of your son's book. In the romancer, the urbanites are envisioned as possessing a brain-computer interface that allows them to assume that access the global computer network in cyberspace, creating a virtual parallel world that they find as real as or even more real than the physical world that they inhabit. Yet, despite technocrats' obsession with the vision of an all-digital world, during the past two decades, an approach has emerged where digitality lends a new material to materiality to everything while augmenting the material individual or so-called zeros and ones. The digital did not kill the physical as fantasized during the 90s, and in fact, the digital and the physical are recombining or, in the words of Hiroshi Ishii, the bits and bricks are married. In 1997, Hiroshi the director of tangible interfaces at MIT Media Lab, wrote a central article entitled Tangible Bits Towards Seamless Interface Between People, Bits, and Atoms, where he coined the term tangible bits, which focuses on the idea of graphable and manipulatable bits of information when coupling the bits with everyday physical objects and architectural surfaces. Yeah. Well, so what she does then, she goes on uh, to look at some other theoretical work, in particular cybernetics. Uh, cybernetics is very interesting, is about dynamic systems and how they interact. It's all science that emerged like 60, 70 years ago. And she looks at that really as the framework to conceptualize, uh, to conceptualize architecture and where it is moving. So really, uh, we all would encourage you to, uh, to listen to it uh, before going to sleep tonight. And, um, uh, and uh, Nashid and I should be on the line, so we can have a little interactive session in, uh, in, in 45 minutes. But my suggestion would be also just to, you know, so that you can stand up and do a bit of physical exercise, would be now you've heard a lot of information, probably too much for the first day, but it was, for the first day it was good, just that, you know, you get bombarded with some, some stuff. And uh, now we would like to ask you to sub to uh, divide yourself in groups of six persons each, you can take the chairs, you have different groups, six persons, which have seven groups in total of us. And uh, actually each group will have like 20 minutes to talk among themselves, first to elect in a democratic way a rapporteur, somebody who will come here then later and speak. Each group will have a sticky note to take notes, and it has to come here, then we have like 20, 25 minutes to, for discussion internally. Um, Adam will tell you when it's five minutes before, before the, the, the end. And then uh, the rapporteur from each group will come here and tell to everybody what are the three most relevant things you've heard today about uh, all the, the different ideas you've received today and what you think would be most relevant for architecture for, based on your experience, based on what you want to do, and so on. So come up with a list of the three most relevant ideas uh, that you've heard today or uh, possible applications in general to architecture of those ideas and the rapporteur will tell them and share them with everybody. Um, did I forget anything, Alan? No, that's good. Um, we can bring some paper maybe, from how, how much time do you think they should have? I, th I, think we should, I think we should start now dividing into groups, of, into groups just as you want, so you will also, you know, uh, take the chairs and divide yourself into a group of six and start talking about this, and one person will come here and then tell everybody the conclusions of your work. But, but before, before you guys break up, there's, there's another video that the team wanted to show, before, a four-minute video. Can I show it? You want to show the four minutes? Yes. Yeah.